when we really looked at people in our industry who were successful and you start seeing headline numbers, this company sells for, you know, $350 million. You look, oh, they were founded 14 years ago. Welcome to Honesty Commerce, a podcast dedicated to cutting through the BS and finding actionable advice for online store owners. I'm your host, Chase Clymer, and I believe running a direct-to-consumer brand does not have to be complicated or a guessing game. On this podcast, we interview founders and experts who are putting in the work and creating real results. I also share my own insights from running our top Shopify consultancy, Electric Eye. We cut the fluff in favor of facts to help you grow your e-commerce business. Let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Honest E-Commerce. Today, I'm bringing to you not one, but two co-founders of Off Court. They're making personal care products for active people. Welcome to the show, Jonathan and Bonnie. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Thanks, Chase. Excited to be here. I'm excited to chat. Uh, it's not often we have co-founders on the show, but also husband and wife. This is going to be a great episode. Uh, let's dive in though. So talk about quickly, uh, off court. What are the types of products that you're actually bringing to market? What are you guys selling right now? Uh, we sell body products. So deodorant, spray, soaps, body washes, face moisturizer. Uh, and we recently launched our fine fragrances. Awesome. Awesome. So take me back in time. Where did the idea for this product come from? What was going on? Yeah, uh, the idea came in 2018. I was at Columbia Business School doing an MBA and looking for a class project. Uh, prior to that, I was a consultant in retail. Uh, so I was looking in the retail space. At a time, I was also um, working at Glossier, which uh, in 2018-17, it was really growing very fast. The whole direct-to-consumer was a very, very big thing. Um and John and I brainstormed and came up with the idea of products for people who sweat uh, and take multiple showers a day with a focus on fragrances, but doing all of that in the affordable pricing uh, range rather than products that are forty, fifty, sixty dollars. Awesome! Sounds like a uh, it sounds like a great idea. How did you validate this idea? How did you make sure that there is actually people willing to buy it? Um. So we from from day one. I mean, I guess at the beginning. Um, we interviewed about, I mean, I was at school, I had free time and access to people. And we interviewed about two to 300 people on what they use, how they use it, what they think about the category, just really just understanding consumer expectation and perception, how they make shopping, where do they shop from. Um, but I think John and I fundamentally, maybe as two management consultants, believe that if you have in CPG world, a product that looks better, smells better, it hits everything that from a trend perspective that the industry, you know, pushes out. And if it is at the right, great price, you can always sell that. And I don't think we really validate the idea in details. Like we weren't, you know, running ads on Instagram to see if people like our design or anything like that. We had like a very small group of people that we were validating the design with. Uh, and then I think we just kind of took the risk. And it was just after COVID that we launched a brand in 2021. Absolutely. And it, you know, with a, when you're launching a product that has, you know, built in competition in a, not a saturated kind of space, but like this is probably the 10th time I've, I've mentioned Ready Fire Aim on this podcast. Everyone just go listen to that book. It's the best book ever. But, uh, yeah, it's like you can kind of skip a few steps if you are basically building not a copy of something that's already exists, but it's like, yeah, it's pretty validated. People are already buying this thing. Exactly. That's, yeah, I was going to say it's a great point. You know, the market exists. It's not you're starting a totally new market. It's just can you make a product that's good enough and can you get people's attention? Absolutely. All right. So you, you've got a product in mind. What, how do you make it? What's the next step? You, how do you go from idea to something physical, tangible to sell? Uh, for us, it was kind of two, path, two paths. One was the branding. Uh, and I think in CPG, more than ever, that is an important part of the puzzle. Um, our approach from day one was if this looks really good, um, we can get people to buy it because it's going to be $10, $12. It's almost what people pay today. So if it looks, if it stands out from competition, we are winning. And then the second piece of it is how do, how do we formulate this? This is where my background came uh, into the picture. I grew up in a family business in beauty and knew a lot about formulation. You know, I was in another beauty brand. So I, the first thing was kind of figuring out approaches to product development. And I was adamant from day one that for this to be something real, we need to own all of our formulas 
meaning recipe, and we need to custom create fragrances. And so with that, we had two more paths, create the base of the products and then create fragrances. And I would say that both of them are really, really hard. There are lots of barrier to entry. If you're not a celebrity brand with, you know, a contract at Alta, no manufacturer really wants to work with you. So we went to a, an independent chemist who formulated the, uh, the products for us. Uh, we actually have worked with many chemists throughout the years now. And uh, the second piece was fragrance. And it's such an art and science and it's such a challenging world to get into because the fragrance houses aren't designed to work with startups. They want, you know, they want tied so that they're selling a million kilos of fragrance <laughs> per month. Um, for that, we, uh, we, found a consultant she's a hall of famer very popular in the industry and basically convinced her to work with us uh and then she kind of then took us to to fragrance houses i don't know if i missed anything john you could... well i would just say a couple of things so what you said there is exactly right i mean some people when they start and it depends on what you're trying to do you definitely see some people when they just have an idea they can go and white label it and maybe it's because they have such a big social media presence. They're really well known. If they put their name on it, it's going to sell. That was not going to be us. We were never going to white label this from the beginning. Then you're kind of beholden to a manufacturer. So we really went the custom route. I would say just a little lesson there that we had, and it was really important for us, is when you're working with your chemist who's formulating it, actually then tying in very, very early the manufacturer. Because sometimes what the chemist does kind of designs and the formulation and the kind of pricing guidance they give maybe isn't practical in reality at the quantities we want or the manufacturers that will work with us. So you really have to tie those two in early. Um, and on fragrance, that was, um, yeah, that was a really interesting one. Fragrance is a very challenging world to break into. And Banny was just very, very persuasive by finding the right consultant because oddly, it seemed crazy to me, but a fragrance house, you cannot pay them to give you a fragrance. They just sell you the actual fragrance once it's designed. So we couldn't even just go in and buy their kind of expertise. So we had to persuade them that, listen, we're bankable, invest all your time and energy on us. And eventually we're going to be really successful and sell thousands and thousands of kilos or buy thousands of kilos of fragrance. That's so interesting uh, talking about needing to get the manufacturer involved a little bit earlier than you'd think it to draw a parallel to you know what we do over at the agency all the time it's like we want to be seeing the designs before they're done to say like hey that's not realistic on how these softwares work or that's going to be a lot more work have you thought about doing it this way that's going to save you tens of thousands of dollars because it's a little more off the shelf uh so i think it is kind of like making sure everyone's communicating within that creative part of of building something so you have a product right it smells great. It's a cool formulation that's unique to yourself. What's the next step? Well, the next step was launch. And I think we maybe started this business in 2021. And 2021 was like a very odd year from COVID. We, we launched in March. It was still very much of a COVID. We were all at home. Um, and, you know, we had an initial thought of, well, you have to spend money, go out there, you know, acquire lots of customers that that was maybe a little bit of an our expectation than like month one, and then it quickly changed in month two. So we launched the company uh, really just with PR um, and just a little bit of Facebook ads. And on ads, we were for the most part just trying to like, you know, test the language, how we talk about it, see if it, if it makes any difference. To be honest, it, it wasn't making any difference because we weren't spending you know, tens of thousands of dollars on those ads. They were just very, I guess, uh, small budget. Um, but PR was amazing for us. From day one of launch of this company, every opportunity came for us really through PR. Um, very quickly after launch, we got a retailer interested, Urban Outfitters. So kind of three months later, we launched at Urban Outfitters with a lot of products. Uh, we're no longer there today. Uh, but, you know, that was a very good validation. Um, and then kind of slowly, a lot of editors picked the products. They could see the difference. You know, they test so many products. They could just understand where, where we're playing and we from there to now we kind of consistently get you know 10 to 15 features and pr has been a big part of our brand if i could add to that i'd say it's kind of interesting when you launch there's a uh, there's a pressure there's certain expectations out there you read kind of these 
you know, these great stories that are becoming kind of infamous and, you know, Harry's launch and they had this email distribution list and they blasted through and they sell out instantly. Um, even though when we launched from the beginning, we sat down and we said to ourselves many times, listen, we'll have to be omni-channel and fundamentally the price point that we're at, the volume we will have in the future will come from retail. And we told ourselves that. And we said, we are going to be in the business of initially launching online and selling individual units. Our future will be selling pallets. Like that is what this business is going to be built on. We knew all that, but you still feel this pressure when you launch, like, oh, we have to grow. And we got some sales in the first month. And okay, well, now we need to grow 25% next month and 25% the following month. And even though that wasn't the game, I think for the first couple of months, we got caught up thinking it was going to be that kind of DTC game. And we even told ourselves, listen, DTC is not what it was when Banny was at Glossier. The world has changed. You know, the cost on Facebook is vastly different now. Um, but yeah, it was funny. The first couple of months, we really thought like that. And then it was like, okay, slow down. When we really looked at people in our industry who were successful, and you start seeing headline numbers, this company sells for, you know, $350 million. You look, oh, they were founded 14 years ago. It is kind of a slow and steady, you get there, you find real customers, you integrate yourself into their daily routine. They slowly tell their friends about it. You pick up a, a good feature here and there. And that's really how we've kind of built our base rather than on the, the DTC ecom. And I think I want to add to that because I think the first three months when we had all of this crazy expectation, we ended up, I think, uh, winning like three or four industry awards. And that was a really good validation for us that we are making something different. We just have to figure out the customer acquisition. And this is good enough that, you know, we, we want to ask men, men's health, Today Show picked it up. This all happened in the first three months. And we weren't really doing anything but to send them the actual product. And at the time, the product was just body spray in three fragrances. And that was the only thing. Um, that gave us this kind of mentality that our goal isn't to just go there and acquire a customer every day, but our goal is to kind of exist in the world and land a retailer as a partner because this product, the products we're making, you know, less than 10, 12, 15 in these categories, just existing online and growing online is really, really hard. Absolutely. Products that have uh, lower AOVs and once you... Do shipping and and uh, you know the cost to fulfill these things and loss. It's it, it's a hard game for for lower commoditized items. Um, so I, I have so many follow up questions for you. So uh, first and foremost, uh, were you guys bootstrapped? Did you take on some initial investment? How did you afford this launch? Uh, we raised money, but it was like friends and family. $10,000 checks. So this is not any fundraising that was glamorous or anything like that. Uh, I think we raised like $400,000 and that's kind of uh, got us through a lot of the launch and beyond. Yeah. And we self-funded for a good amount before that too. We wanted to make sure that we truly had products. We actually developed four products. We didn't mention that. Four different products in three different scents that we developed ourselves first and then launched. Of course, when we launched, we focused on just one. But yeah, we had a, we had a modest budget. And so we had to stay pretty lean and mean. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to take a few moments to talk about a partnership we've had at the agency for years. Electric Eye and Recharge have been partners for longer than I can remember. Recharge is our go-to solution for clients when it comes to subscriptions. At Electric Eye, we know the ins and outs of Recharge. For example, we've set up replenishment subscriptions for consumables, created countless subscribe and save campaigns, and most recently, we got a client into a Recharge beta program to utilize Recharge's dynamic bundling solution for subscriptions. We've partnered with Recharge to solve subscription, loyalty, and membership for a div diverse range of clients spanning industries like food and beverage, automotive, supplements, CPG, and beauty. Not only is Recharge an incredible partner, they've been paving the way for subscription solutions longer than anyone else in the game. The product is unmatched, giving them a massive advantage against the competition. Clients often come to us because they've struggled to find agencies that truly understand how to harness the power of Recharge. We're not just familiar, we're bona fide Recharge experts. It's one of our specialties. It's a pain point we're happy to solve. As a top tier Recharge expert, we have unparalleled access to support and resources that ensure we'll have a successful outcome. We stay appraised of all their new feature releases and compatibilities, 
bundling, memberships, flows, you name it, we know it. So if subscriptions, memberships, or loyalty are on your to-do list and you're ready to have it done, just let us know. Visit electriceye.io slash recharge today to learn more about how we can tailor Recharge's robust product to your specific needs. That's E-L-E-C-T-R-I-C-E-Y-E dot I-O slash R-E-C-H-A-R-G-E. Let the experts at Electric Eye get it done the right way the first time. Join the ranks of our satisfied clients who partnered with us and recharged to harness recurring revenue within their business. If you don't know what that sound is, you might be listening to the wrong podcast. That is the sound of another sale on your Shopify store. That's right, folks. We finally made it. Shopify is a sponsor of today's episode of Honest Ecommerce. And I'm here today to talk about Shopify's point of sale solution. Shopify point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. With Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. This has been a huge issue for clients of our agency in the past. You need your inventory to be synced in real time and Shopify POS does just that. Connect with customers in store and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. You can get hardware that fits your business, take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's POS Go mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning help is there to support your success at every step along the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial at shopify.com slash honest, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash honest, H-O-N-E-S-T, to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash honest. All right, I want you to picture this. You're an e-commerce merchant juggling multiple platforms to manage your email marketing, SMS campaigns, and product reviews. It's a time-consuming and costly ordeal. But with Sendlane, those days of chaos are long gone. Sendlane brings together the power of email, SMS, and reviews all in one convenient place. So you can say goodbye to the hassle of separate tools and hello to simplified operations, increased efficiency, unified customer experience, and huge savings. And I haven't even gotten to the best part. With the all new free Send Lane reviews, you can leverage social proof to build trust and credibility with potential customers. Let me say that again, free product reviews. With Send Lane, you pay for email and SMS and you get reviews for free. Sendlane understands that customer feedback is essential for the success of any e-commerce business. That's why they've made an integral part of their platform without any additional cost to you. By unifying these key components of your tech stack, Sendlane helps you save time and money all while generating more revenue. Don't let your e-commerce tech stack hold you back. Embrace the unifying force of Sendlane and take your business to new heights. Sign up today and experience the power of streamlined operations, increased efficiency, and revenue growth. Visit sendlane.com slash honest to learn more and schedule your free consultation with a Sendlane expert. That's sendlane.com slash honest. Are you allowed to share anything about the budgets that you put into having a PR team, what you were putting behind Facebook uh, for that initial launch yeah. uh, where you may or may not have gotten distracted by the shiny direct to consumer, uh, direct response world? I want to say we were paying our PR from like $4,000 which I think every penny was worth it, to be very honest with you. Well, we made a lot of changes, I think is another interesting thing, is the, let's say, our marketing agency that we started with, uh, we changed and then changed again, and then really moved to a freelance model. And PR, we started with one and then changed to another one. And so what we found, I think, is we probably were able to reduce those costs by more than 50%. When you first launch, you don't really know what value and what they're bringing and all of that. You get a recommendation, you go with a firm and find that, okay, you're paying a lot and maybe not getting as much. I think we were able to get as much or more um, by reducing it. But yeah, our first marketing agency, I can't remember. Do you remember? I mean, we were paying like a thousand dollar and we were with them for one month and realized we can't continue doing this. 
But, you know, at the beginning, yeah. we just needed extra people to do things. Yeah, set up ads and get everything going. Now all of these happen in-house. We only just have a PR uh, PR firm that we work with in high seasons. So, you know, we'll be we'll be turning on our PR in September. But they, the PR was off in summer for us, for example. Um, and we don't really use any marketing agencies. We have pretty much we do everything in-house. Freelancers that freelancers, advisors, and then John and me, we are involved in all of that process of you know marketing ads. Absolutely. So you mentioned that you knew you were going to be omni-channel from the get-go. Um, can you explain a little bit more about what that means to you, to the audience that might be a little bit newer to the space? Uh, where exactly are you, you know, trying to sell the product? So it's very interesting. When we did the customer acquis- uh, customer interviews uh, before launching the company, and asked everybody, "Where do you buy your body wash? Where do you buy your, uh, you know, deodorant?" There were two categories of answers. One was like classic New Yorkers, which is where we live, like it was Amazon. And then majority of other people was like at a CVS or at a Target. So it was very clear for us from day one that this is not really, people aren't really looking for relationship, direct relationship with a brand um, for body products. They are like kind of picking up something close to their homes. Um, and that, that from day one made our strategy of you know being priced less than $15 that means going to Target, Walmart, CVS um and you know some of the other boutiques but that was being in national retailers at mass level was the goal from day one for us. Yeah, and I think we view it as, you know, of course direct to consumer is the way to launch because you're not out there, you don't have retail partnerships and Amazon which is a completely different beast. And then retail and retail, there's lots of different ways to look at, you know, mass and boutique. For us, we kind of positioned this from the beginning and said, we eventually want to get to be a premium product at Walmart. Like, what is the most expensive product they'll accept in this category and sell at Walmart? If we can do that, we know we can fit in a lot of places such as Target, CVS, et cetera. Um, boutiques are another great spot for us as well as fitness outlets because we are kind of targeting um, athletic uh, lifestyles. Um, so again, retail, but kind of a, a smaller, more boutique category. Absolutely. Now, it's been a couple of years since launch. Uh, obviously, direct consumer isn't as much as a focus these days. So what shifted? Where did the energy start to go? So when we launched, we had three SKUs. We knew to go to retail, we need more. So the first, I want to say, year and a half of the business was just bringing all of these products to market and tweaking. And by tweaking, you know, our body spray is reformulated three times. Um our body wash is reformulated twice. Like there's a lot of reformulation happens. Now we're at a stage that everything, all the formulas are final, all of our packaging, the whole like product side is very buttoned up. And I I would say it was about last year uh, where we started, you know, discussing with retailers. Um, Yeah, probably a year ago. And we've spoken to CVS, Walmart, um, and we were always speaking and continue to speak with smaller boutiques, um, you know, and then we landed a um, a deal with Walmart to go into 50% of Walmart stores in the U.S. That's a pretty big order. Yeah, it's massive. <laughs> it's interesting because uh, uh, we went to Bentonville last year and we had no idea who we were even talking to. Is this really going to work? John and I went to a Walmart store beforehand. And then we looked at like the soap section and we're like, oh my God, we can never sell here. Five soaps for $3. Like, how is this even possible? <laughs> One of our soaps is $8. Uh, went to body wash. It was the same. And then we kind of met with a few buyers at Walmart. And I would say sometimes things happen for a reason. I think the best area of Walmart where we could have dreamed about. They picked us up and they said, this is kind of the premium bath. Every product is more premium and your price point fits, but we also have a white space. Uh, So it all worked out really well. And we got the interest from them in terms of like carrying us in February. And we had from February to July to make 
a lot of products, but also not knowing how many stores we're going to be in and how much they're going to be buying. So this was all John where he was like running all these models of this is the scenario if they buy this many. So we were all like on guesswork, creating all of these products when we really don't have money or resources to do this and hoping they will buy until July. So the order came in on a Wednesday and was picked up on a Monday. This is how quick, like we needed to have everything ready to go and be able to ship within like four days, which, you know, nobody knows. I think we're really like probably the smallest brand who has ever gone to Walmart with like two people. Walmart is very interesting. And I think all mass retailers, obviously they hold the power. As Benny said, we went, we met with them and they told us in February, you have been awarded this. Asterix, probably. Like they have all the right to not award it to you. They won't tell you how many stores, they won't tell you how many units they're going to purchase. None of it's guaranteed. They give you a rough indication of historically what they do, but they hold their cards close to their chest right up until the week before you have to ship. And then you get the purchase order. On our side, we have to ramp up everything on our operations to be able to deliver somewhere between a few thousand and, you know, tens of thousands of units uh, the next week. And so that's a that's a really interesting challenge. You have to be really okay with kind of the ambiguity of it. You don't want to over order because, you know, obviously that can put a, a real, you know, financial pressure on your business, but you don't want to under order because if you don't deliver to Walmart, you really get one shot. And if they don't properly set you in the stores, you're really done. And that's true for all mass retail. But uh, yeah, it was a fun challenge, but anyways, it worked out fine. They ordered 50% more than we had forecast but we had just enough extra inventory to meet that. And then we immediately the next day had to put in uh, an order for uh, new production. That's amazing. Now, is there anything that I didn't ask you about today that you think would resonate with our audience? So I'm sure there's a few things. One, just talking about the Walmart order that I just find quite funny is I've just found in a business that, you know, you make a lot of plans. And when we look back on our plans, there's a couple of funny things to me is one, Nothing ever went to plan. It was all just, it feels like all of it went off the rails. But when I actually look back at our old financial model that we pitched to our friends and family, it's actually very accurate, believe it, directionally of what we thought for revenue, what we thought for growth, the timing of launching new products and the timing for getting into mass retail. It worked out just not as we expected. We thought Target would be the first one and, you know, not, we thought Walmart would be five years out. And then, Another funny thing about this Walmart thing is that we had been talking to CVS a couple times and they wanted us to come in and we rejected them because we're just not mature enough and right for that type of environment. We went down to Bentonville fully with the expectation that Walmart is not a fit for us and we will be saying no. And we went and looked at a Walmart and confirmed our hypothesis. This is not the right partner. And then we went into that room with that mindset. And they told us, actually, we've got a new section and we're not positioning you there. We'd like to position you here next to these other brands and you'll be the only body washing of these things. And we ended up leaving saying, one, it's a great fit. And two, we got it. And I'm not quite sure what that is, but there's something about sometimes you go into a meeting really kind of pushing hard to try and sell it and it doesn't work out. And there's sometimes you go into it, um, maybe just a different mindset and a different position. And it ended up we got there and they were selling to us. And uh, it was a nice position to be in such that they weren't even asking us in that meeting questions about like, how big are you? How long have you been around? How many employees? Are you sure you can fulfill millions of dollars in orders if we actually award this to you? It was more like, no, let us show you why we think you're a good fit here. Um, And so that was totally unintentional, but it obviously worked out well for us. Also, I think uh, kind of maybe just adding to what John was saying, you really don't know what works and what doesn't. So parallel pathing and pursuing multiple options with a true, real, open mind without being jaded either by rejection or things that happen happen along the way, but just also keep, you know, keeping an open mind and showing up for, you know, every meeting. I think that's why we, we could get to a mass retailer very quickly. Yeah. There's a couple other maybe key lessons. I think for a brand, if you want to be on the channel and get into retail, finding a good rep firm, very important. Like a rep firm who has relationships with the retailers you want to be in, they're going to go out and they're basically your business development team for you. 
um, if they're already selling products or to the retailers in the right um, parts of the store that you want to be in, uh, the right category, but it's not completely competitive, it really helps because they already have all those meetings lined up and then they can just slide you in as, oh, here's another interesting product you'd like. So I think finding the right rep firm is, uh, is key to success and our rep firm is certainly key to getting into Walmart. And then one other thing that's just been a good learning that Banny was saying about parallel pathing, what comes with that too is maybe just kind of having the confidence or just the conviction to, to change your plan and change your mind on anything. Like we said, we did a lot of work finding a marketing agency to launch with. We lasted 30 days with them. It was very, very quick to assess. This is critical. We're spending money. Do we need to be spending this money? We could have afforded to keep going for s several more months, but no, it was pull off the Band-Aid, like we can go find a new one. And so we made, I think, very, very quick decisions in that first year um, because you don't know what's going to work. There's a lot of instability. That's okay. Make changes. And now the business feels much more stable. Um, because we found the right partners. Awesome. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and sharing your story. If I'm listening to this and I want to try the product, where should I go? What should I do? Um, you can go on offcourt.com and we would love to make, give you a discount code for your audience. Uh, oh, awesome. Yes. Um, let's do Honest Commerce 15. We'll make that discount code 15% off everything on our website. Um, you can definitely go on Amazon, but every box from our direct store is much nicer with more samples and things like that. So yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. And coming soon, very soon in uh, Walmart. So that'll be, uh, it's just starting to go on shelves now and starting September. Uh, you'll see us in Walmart. That's amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. We'll make sure to link to that, uh, put that discount code in the show notes for everybody. Um, and I look forward to talking again in the future. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Chase. Appreciate it. We can't thank our guests enough for coming on the show and sharing their knowledge and journey with us. We've got a lot to think about and potentially add into our own businesses. You can find all the links in the show notes. You can subscribe to the newsletter at honestycommerce.co to get each episode delivered right into your inbox. If you're enjoying this content, consider leaving a review on iTunes that really helps us out. Lastly, if you're a store owner looking for an amazing partner to help you get your Shopify store to the next level, reach out to Electric Eye at electriceye.io slash connect. Until next time.